I want to take a look at the chapter of uh, uh, the contest for Drapati, the uh, the princess who uh, it is decided she will marry the uh, the winner of a uh, a, a competition, <clears throat> and uh, to this event it draws all sorts of people again. You know, it's a big event. Uh, everybody wants a piece of Drapati, including the, uh, the Pandava brothers, the five Pandavas. They have been in exile, uh, since their cousin tried to kill them. Uh, they've been sort of hiding out in disguise, uh, disguised as Brahmins, uh, as essentially... Um, spiritual, uh, essentially priests, um, more like monks, honestly, but you know, uh, they have been disguised as that and they come to, uh, they come to town to try and, uh, partake in this contest. Now. On a big picture, on a big picture thing, you have uh, these uh, Pandavas who are warrior caste, um, and remember the hierarchy, where the Brahmins are at the top, the warriors are underneath, and then it goes down into like the the artisans and the the, the farmers, and then you know the the untouchables, the uh, the the you know the the really dirty people. So much of this story is told, uh, is centered around the warrior caste. Um, the Drapadis are all warriors, almost all warriors. Uh, well, yeah, the, um, but just above them, technically, is this Brahmin class. But now you have this image of the warriors, the great warriors, coming in disguised as Brahmins. And you get some really interesting uh, details getting thrown in there that I think casts or makes yeah. one think about the validity of that priority of the Brahmins. You know, oh, the Brahmins, they're so special. But from the perspective of this thing, the little details that get thrown out, you can't help but wonder, like, well, you know, uh, why are they so special? Why are they better than the warriors? And the minute you have any character in any text in disguise as someone else, that sort of brings that out. It makes you wonder, well, what is the difference between the two? Is it just, you know, oh, he put on a cloak, so now he's a completely different person. It's starting to seem a little superficial. At last, the auspicious day, the sky was brilliant. Brahmins had consecrated the event. Crowds of spectators, fizzing with excitement, were pressing forward into the arena where Draupadi's future would be decided. Surrounded by tall mansions, glistening white as the sunlit snows of the Himalaya, and lavishly adorned with costly hangings, the amphitheater, was an impressive sight. Now, it harkens back to what we were saying about the uh, the uh, the crowds at the other big event, the tournament, where it's so much excitement, everybody's thrilled to be there. You know, live events, all of that stuff. Um, you can see them sort of like striding through. You feel the the buzz of the crowd. The sky was brilliant. Uh, Brahmins had consecrated the event, crowds of spectators fizzing with excitement. Uh, well, what do we know about excitement? Hmm. For, uh, in this context, is excitement a good thing? Uh, generally, no. In the context of this text, uh, excitement is attachment. Excitement is uh, a commitment to uh, earthly emotions or earthly results of fate. 
uh, excitement isn't necessarily a good thing. And when you have those two tight little uh, lines together, again, translation, very difficult to really examine here, but Brahmins had consecrated the event, crowds of spectators fizzing with excitement. Those two things are right next to one another, the Brahmins and the crowds. Now, we saw yesterday, uh, well, we saw in the, uh, the discussion of, uh, of the, the crowds at the tournament that the crowds aren't always put in uh, the most favorable light. They're just sort of the mob. They're never really individualized beyond that. Uh, and they're always sort of getting caught up in things, as crowds tend to do. But that connection in simple proximity to the Brahmins, I think, is significant. The Brahmins are right next to the mention of crowds, excited crowds. Hmm. Uh, that's just a little warning shot right there. And then all of that other stuff in there, they were all there. Why? Because this is where Draupadi's future would be decided. They are committed to the event. They are attached. They have curiosity. They are almost lusting after the results, the news. Oh, you got to tell me. It's like scrolling through Instagram. Oh, I can't break off now. I got to find out more stuff. They're too invested in what happens instead of reflective and being detached. And then all of those somewhat, remember the use of the word gaudy uh, in, in the, the tournament, uh, all those kind of materialistic hints getting sort of flared here and there, uh, surrounded by tall mansions. Ooh, boy, materialism, uh, money, among other things, uh, lavishly adorned with costly hangings. Uh, this is significant. This isn't just ooh and ah. This is, oh, you think that's ooh and ah? You're impressed by that? Well, what does that say about you? Are you really impressed? Hmm little things matter little things suggest what's really going on here the story is you know the story but the details that get noted along the way uh, are often more important uh, the contest itself is a kind of uh, hero's task about uh, phenomenal skill with a uh, with a bow and arrow, uh, but it's also kind of a silly one. Uh, you have to string the bow and hit the target with each of the arrows aiming through the wheel. Uh, it sounds more like a carnival game, to be perfectly honest. Uh, like you get a teddy bear at the end instead of a wife. Um, but, you know, all right, fine. And this alone isn't necessarily all that strange. There is an archery contest uh, in, in the Odyssey where only Odysseus can string his bow and thus proves to, uh, to, to everybody or all of his enemies who he is because he also has been in disguise and there's this whole other thing. So there's a long tradition of this particular um, thing going on here. But it does seem a little silly. You know, it sounds like a carnival game. Uh, and that you're allowed to judge that, I think. I think you're allowed to come in and say, well, yeah, that's just kind of ridiculous. Uh, Arjuna easily wins this contest. Uh, but he's, he does so in disguise as a Brahmin. And everybody flips out. Why? You're not allowed to compete. It's only for the warriors or something like that. Uh, the Kshatriyas, or however you pronounce that. Um, the crowd of other warriors 
and again, they're not really individualized so much. They are just more the crowd. Uh, and the crowd is always getting swept up in this emotion or that emotion uh, and are kind of treated like the rabble. Uh, so, you know, bear that in mind. Um, they object. Fighting happens. It's it's kind of uh, uh, you know rough and tumble. Um, Krishna has to step in, and uh, was it Krishna? I think so. And declare that Arjuna is clearly the winner. He won fair and square, and it becomes obvious. Becomes everybody realizes. Wait a minute, the Pandavas are here. They're not really just anonymous Brahmins. They are the greatest warriors this country has ever seen. Uh, and automatically, again, you're, you're looking at them and say, well, you know, hmm. The, uh, the Brahmins in the audience or in the crowd had been equally interested in... Uh, well, uh, the results, they had been very committed to the results of what would happen. Uh, so that's a curious line right there. Um, so all this going on, like, well, the Brahmins, you know? But again, remember that, uh... The Brahmins are, well, the Brahmins outrank in this hierarchy. The Brahmins, the Brahmins outrank the warrior class. And if this is all about the warrior class, and this whole story, this whole text is promoting the warrior class, uh, well, they got to sort of bump up against the Brahmins. There's no point in punching down on the people beneath you. You you want to take on the big guy who's holding you back, who has all of the prominence that you would like. And think about that a little. If the if the Brahmins are being shown to be just a little superficial uh, by being attached to the outcome of this event by being swept up in the crowd to a certain degree. And if the warriors themselves, the Pandavas, can just put on a, uh, a costume, the clothing of a Brahmin, and people just naturally take them for that, then what is the actual distinction? So you can see how this text is sort of undermining their authority and shifting it and saying, well, okay, but the warriors have pretty much the same authority. Now, this is coming after a, a the, the whole history of the text is, is kind of, you know, confusing and it, 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 well, it's not confusing so much as it's just very long. We're dealing with a very rich civilization here. Uh, but they, the, this text is coming in the wake of a, uh, a kind of inviolable authority, cultural authority of uh, so-called Vedic texts, uh, essentially spiritual writings where the priests, the Brahmins, uh, had absolute authority over all, uh, all matters. And they specialized in this very obscure, um, complicated, philosophical, theological um, realm uh, of, uh, of, of debate and text and authority that nobody else could really participate in. So now this text is coming along and saying, yeah, but okay, uh, we're better. You know, we have something more to offer. We can appeal to uh, more worldly matters. It's great that, you know, you're sitting there and you're 
praying and doing all that spiritual stuff. And we can maybe share a little bit in that, knowing about, you know, okay, well, we're covered for the afterlife or whatever. Um, but what matters more is here. Not now, more, but what matters as well is here. And think about also about how sensuous this text is. All of the uh, all of the details that are in the crowd scenes and stuff that are so emotional. All of this, those moments of the story gripping you and saying, okay, this is happening now, and then this happened, and then this happened. And you want to invest in it. That's kind of validating, uh, even as it's questioning, that natural human instinct those human desires, those human wants that are opposed to the spiritual. So you can see this text saying it's not that simple. It's not, you know, it, you can't just say that the spiritual realm is the only one that matters. It has to be that balance between the spiritual and the physical, the material. And Figuring that out is not simple. So this story within the text is constantly wrestling with that. How do we, uh, how do we behave in a way that, in a way that, uh, how do we behave in this world in a way that comports with the rules of spiritual um, uh, truth? and value. What is our duty, our dharma in this world in accordance with the priorities of an ideal world? Everything in this story, in this narrative, plays that out from different angles. And sometimes the, uh, the answers seem obvious, uh, sometimes less so. And you're meant to kind of struggle with them. And yes, you are meant to go and reread it from time to time, saying, well, uh, what? What? What is that? Kunti had stayed at home, restless, enduring, hour after hour, that dull anxiety so familiar to mothers everywhere. She thought of everything that was at stake and of the dangers. At last, she heard her son's voices in the, in the yard. Mother, mother, we have brought back largesse. Then, my dears, you will share it equitably between you, called Kunti. Then they walked in with Trapati. <laughs> The mom says, our policy is one of the five of you wins something, it belongs to everybody. And that includes a wife. Um, the complications of that we can get to, but first let me just point out, uh, Kunti had stayed at home, restless, enduring, hour after hour, um, she thought of everything that was at stake and of the dangers, everything that was at stake. She was uh, passionately committed to the outcome of fate. She was emotionally invested in what happened. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? In this story, it seems to be a well, it seems to be a complication. It seems to be a little unsettled. On the one hand, she is being very emotional. And women are always being uh, portrayed as emotional. To their, you know, as a, as a snide, uh, you know, commentary. But also, isn't it natural and unavoidable that a mother with five sons who are going in and essentially, uh, you know, in a dangerous situation, uh, they're not doing battle here, but it's a kind of battle, 
Uh, and she knows that spirits can run high, people can get ca carried away, and uh, they are, after all, in disguise for a reason, because the king and uh, all of their cousins uh, have it in for them. They've already tried to kill them. So uh, it is only natural for a mother to be concerned for her children. So you can blame her for it, but she has no choice. On that individual, uh, individualistic way of looking at her as a character, you can see that, well, there, it's impossible to not be concerned even if spiritually we're told that, well, you shouldn't be. Just accept it all with attachment, detachment, rather. Uh, but that conflict, I think, is significant. How do you do that? And the issue that she comes up with, of course, highlights that even further. She decides that, okay, all five of you will marry that one girl. Cher! Uh, well, obviously, uh, that's problematic. Um, what we're talking about here is not polygamy, where uh, uh, one man marries many women. Here it is polyandry. Uh, one woman married to many men. And no judgment necessarily on this. There are many cultures that today practice this. Um, on the pro side, you got to admit that um, among warriors, and these are all warriors, the five of them, uh, you have to expect that uh, at any time, any one of them could be killed. Uh, death would be expected um, early and suddenly, with no warning. Uh, so, you know, it makes sense for a girl to cover her bets, so to speak. Uh, the... The economic advantages for the uh, for the uh, the Pandava family, I think, are fairly obvious. In that they don't divide the wealth of the family so much. They uh, they keep the family very tight and unified. Um, theoretically, all the brothers get an equal share and are in perfect harmony. And what could go wrong with that? Um, and it perpetuates the family along that single line instead of, you know, oh, okay, well, uh, this one's going to go over there and this one's going to go over there. So we got to start chopping, uh, chopping up the estate and all of that and all oh, the headaches. Um, but it all demands that sense of detachment, the denial of the individual human want that sense of individuality that we all naturally um, exercise. Culturally, there, you know, there are a lot of distinctions here. This is a very different culture than contemporary American uh, perspectives. So it, it's hard to divorce that. And I don't think we necessarily should. We should just acknowledge the distinctions and try and work within them. But <laughs> dividing that one girl among five brothers uh, denies each of the brothers a sense of individuality with their relationship, a sense of, you know, a, uh, a personal connection, and it denies her the same thing. This is not a particularly flattering environment for, uh, for Draupadi. Think about this perspective from her. The, uh, she is just sort of passed around, theoretically. Um, 
how does this benefit her? How does is her entire role, her her whole identity about just you know continuing that line? Her whole role is to bear children for this group of guys that, you know, come visit her, theoretically, you know, a different one each night. Um, where does that, you know, ideally, perhaps it does make sense. On a realistic and human level, it's more complicated than that. And the oddity of the situation prompts the question, well, where do you find the balance? How can you how can you justify one in terms of the other? Um, Drapati's father objects. Um, <laughs> Drapati's father is named Drapada. Uh, it is not uncommon for girls in the ancient world to be just named after their father or being a derivation of their father because, you know, oh, why waste an identity on a girl? Mm. Very common in the ancient world. Next day, Drapada sent a splendid chariot to bring the Pandavas to the royal palace where they decorated, where they declared their true identities. He asked the brothers how they escaped the dreadful fire and what had happened since. The story took some time. Drapada smiled. Now you need have no worries. All my wealth and all my, and my fine army are at my disposal. You will certainly regain your kingdom. The Karavas will not oppose you now. Our dynasties are to be joined by marriage. And he's just, uh, you know, his his mouth is watering <laughs> for the idea of, uh, 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 of the royal family marrying his daughter. And he is seeing, you know, uh, he's talking about all the money that he has. He's dreaming about all the money and the prestige that they have. And he's really into it. But five husbands! There he drew the line. A Kshatriya should, could marry several wives, that was normal, but he had never heard of one woman, woman having many husbands. It was not right. It was at odds with Dharma. Yudhishthira referred to well-known stories where rishis, not offenders against Dharma, but holy men, had shared the same woman. That may be well for Brahmins, said Drapada, but not for us. How can I give my daughter, my dark flower, Princess of Panchala, to five husbands and still preserve her honor? Now, he's lusting after the money. Uh, he's very impressed with his own money. Uh, but he's concerned about how it is right, how it is an example of dharma, uh, the, the duty or the, the rightness of an action within a, uh, an, an, an abstract ethical uh, context. Uh, and he's drawing a clear line that says, well, you know, I don't really care about the Brahmins. The Brahmins have their way of doing things, and that's fine. But we're talking about here. We're talking about reality, social reality, as opposed to some, you know, uh, higher plane, idealistic fairy world. So he's very concerned about that line between them, and he sees that, you know, this does not accord with that. Now, this... He objects, you know, on a philosophical basis. He objects saying, well, no, this does not accord with Dharma, suggesting, I would say, that Dharma is meant to be argued about. It is not necessarily something that is manifest, that is obvious. Uh, you cannot just say, and that is Dharma, and everybody agrees. He is very concerned about this. The mention of the story from uh, Yudhishthira, who is the eldest son, ostensibly the best of them, is significant in that he invokes a spiritual, textual example. 
here he's borrowing from the culture of the Vedic literature where he's saying that, well, no, we can use that. We can use the spiritual uh, stuff by interpreting it our own way here in this world. And we are not necessarily going to just kowtow to what the priests and the Brahmins tell us. This is a similar dynamic to the... Um, this is a similar dynamic to the, uh, the, the Protestant Reformation as they broke away from the Catholic Church. They didn't want just an elite cast of priests telling them everything. They said, well, no, we can figure things out. Um, you guys are, you know, your own little group, and, but you have no idea what's going on with our lives. So Yudhishthira is taking that on. He makes that argument based on the established literature, which might be used against them in certain other situations. But here he's saying, nope, that is ours. So he is appealing tra to tradition. Um, he is appealing to the cultural authority of, uh, the, um, uh, of, the, of the text uh, to to uh, to uh, to validate their particular um, their particular uh, uh, decision for for the marriage, and Drapada's reaction to it, I would say, is uh, well, it always makes me kind of smile. Drupada, having overcome his scruples, exulted in the fortune that had brought him five great sons instead of one. He gave them all spacious living quarters and every luxury and entertainment. Krishna and Balarama spent time with them and the cousins became deeply attached. Krishna and Arjuna, in particular, developed a profound friendship. He says, well, okay, that's great. If, if it's okay with you, then sure, I get five of you guys um it's it's funny uh he overcomes his scruples uh again this is a retelling not necessarily a translation uh but within that you know there are all sorts of choices being made so you can't really go by this so locked down but still he overcame his scruples uh <laughs> meaning he was just suddenly okay with it. It's like, well, okay. Yeah. Eh, oh, I had a moral objection for a while there. But now, bah, moral schmorals. Um, and again, he flashes his, uh, his wealth. He says, okay, everybody's going to get so much. Everybody's going to be great. You're, you know, you're all part of my big happy family and all to the glory of me. Uh, exalted in the fortune. He exalted in what happens. He, he is deeply committed and attached to what happens in this world. Um, again, that is a natural reaction, uh, so you can forgive him for that, but it is not necessarily one that comports with the, uh, with the ideal of detachment. And I would say that the continual focus with him on worldly goods, on money, on, uh, on status, all of this signals that this is problematic, that we should be very wary of him. Because the text is telling you, okay, yeah, he's got this, he really likes money, and he's so happy to have status and, and all of this. Uh, the text is not just, you know, telling you, oh, and everybody was so happy. They're sending out very specific details that uh, are problematic or seem contradictory in some way or another. So always when you see that, it's like, why that detail? Why, why, what, what is my reaction to that? If I met this guy at a party and he starts telling me about all the money he has, uh, what is my opinion of that person? Am, am I just, you know, hey, yeah, wow, that's cool. Or am I suddenly like leaning back a little bit?
and saying, eh, yeah, this guy's kind of a jerk. Um, look at it from your own perspective. Judge people and situations uh, in accordance with your own moral code. And you are then participating in exactly what everybody else in the text is supposed to be considering. Does the common reality comport with abstract ideals? Is there a, uh, a, a moral connection between the ideal world and uh, the material? Okay.